Dolls have overwhelmingly been used throughout history for positive reasons. Of course, we all know how much kids love dolls and action figures of all kinds, sparking imagination and helping children to learn and grow through healthy playtime activities. Dolls can represent humans, animals, mythical beings, or even inanimate objects or foods. Over the course of centuries, dolls have been used mostly for entertainment, educational, and developmental purposes, but not always. Let's quickly cover a few historically significant facts about dolls throughout the ages before we dive into the world of modern-day use of dolls in spiritual, religious, and ritual practices, as well as how that could possibly tie in to the Delphi murders of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. We'll cover rumors, redacted quotes from articles, statements made by law enforcement, and more. So let's dig right in. Wooden paddle dolls are among some of the oldest who have ever been discovered. They were found in the tombs of ancient Egyptians that date back to around 2000 BC. Shakti dolls are also well-known figures that were used in ancient Egyptian funerals. They were believed to accompany the dead to the afterlife. Japanese traditional dolls from the Jomon culture date back anywhere from 800 to 2000 BC. They were used as toys as well as for protection purposes and religious ceremonies. Some common Japanese traditional dolls include Dogu, Daruma, and Kokeshi dolls. Ancient Grecian dolls dating around 100 to 200 BC were mostly used by children as toys. It is believed, however, that these dolls originated from ones that were used as religious figurines. They were most often made out of wood or bone. Dolls in Africa have been used for entertainment and education as well as believed to be messengers of gods and ancestors. Dolls have also been used for various ritual purposes throughout the continent of Africa, including healing and fertility rituals. Pictured on the right, intricate Von Bocio dolls originating from Benin in West Africa are adorned with small glass jars attached by rope and are covered in sacrificial fluids. This type of doll is better known in the Western world as a voodoo doll, originating from hoodoo magic practices, which we will touch on more later in this video. The indigenous Hopi people of the Americas are well known for their Kachina dolls. Much like in ancient Africa, these dolls were seen as messengers of the gods and used for ritual purposes. As with other ancient cultures, Hopi children also used dolls for entertainment and education. Each Kachina was meant to be studied and revered as they were believed to have individual characteristics that would bring messages from the gods as well as good luck. Ancient Romans also made dolls from various materials like wood, clay, rags, and even ivory. Roman women and girls offered dolls to goddesses, especially at the time of marriage. Dolls in both ancient Rome and Greece were used by children for play and education, but were also used in religious rituals. Certain types of dolls in both ancient Rome and Greece were never given to children, as they were seen to be heavily charged with, quote, magical powers. An ancient Roman festival named Arge utilized puppets and dolls by placing them around chapels in the Serbian regions. They were believed to absorb all of the impurities and filth in the area, and once a year those dolls became objects of sacrifice. This practice is believed to have replaced the rituals of the ancient Lupercalia festivals as population numbers grew. Instead of running through the town whipping all of the townspeople, the ceremonial virgins would instead just throw the puppets collected from around the chapels into the Tiber River. This was said to purify and bless the townspeople. You can find out a bit more about Lupercalia in some of my earlier videos if you haven't watched them, and I hope to expand on this topic some more as well. There is much more notable doll history throughout the world, but I just wanted to quickly cover some basics and some of the earliest known doll use across several cultures. It would take far too long to extensively cover the history of dolls. But as we can see, dolls are actually an important and prevalent part of most cultures and have a very rich world history. They've been a common aspect linking practices of all kinds of cultures from all over the globe. They're a great reminder that humans everywhere are similar and connected in so many ways. But now that we've covered that brief history, let's quickly discuss some present day use of dolls in spiritual, religious, and ritual practices, and they are not always used for benevolent purposes. I want to start off first and foremost with the voodoo doll. This figurine may be one of the most misrepresented religious icons in American history. 
To be quite blunt about it, straight-up racism and bigotry fueled the demonization and misrepresentation of hoodoo practices through dramatized Hollywood depictions. Voodoo dolls are used for all kinds of benevolent purposes. There are two types of practices in which voodoo dolls can be used benevolently. One practice says that the pins inserted may be healing. The intent of the practitioner is important within hoodoo practices. Another practice involves insertion of pins into the doll to represent a current illness or injury, and over the time span of the ritual, these pins are removed to symbolize healing or the removal of what's causing the pain or suffering. But of course, just as these dolls are more often used for benevolent practices, they can and have been used for malevolent magic. A lesser known doll or figurine used in magic and spiritual practices today is known as a poppet, or sometimes just called a spell doll. A YouTube channel named The Witch of Wonderlust has a video I'll be linking in the description that does a great job of explaining poppets and several ways they may be used in magic. They're most often used for, quote, sympathetic magic, or as I've been calling it, benevolent magic. They can be made from almost any material you can think of. The goal is that it represents the person or target that your spell or ritual is intended for. As with voodoo dolls, though, poppets may be used for malevolent purposes or, quote, baneful magic. Poppets can be made from just about anything you can think of, from paper to sticks to wax and more. A tack lock is used alongside a poppet. It's basically an item that will help connect a poppet or spell doll to the target that the magic spell is intended for. Tack locks can include biological samples like a lock of hair or nail clippings. It could also be a photograph of a person or their written signature or really anything that you feel will help connect your poppet to its intended target in the physical realm. I use the phrase intended target because spells, poppets, and tack locks don't always have to target a human. It could be a pet or even an inanimate object. A tack lock can also be something as simple as a magazine clipping, writing a name on a piece of paper, or carving an initial into a candle. It's just something to help further connect the physical realm to the spiritual realm with your own personal energy and intent to achieve the intended goal of the spell being cast. Now, to tie this into the Delphi murders case, there are rumors that a doll, or maybe even several dolls, were found at the crime scene where Liberty German and Abigail Williams were tragically murdered on February 13, 2017. These rumors have not been confirmed or even addressed by law enforcement. There are also rumors swirling that physical signature items left at the crime scene were of a religious or non-secular nature. A blogger slash author slash professor and woman of many other titles, Cheryl McCollum, had even reported on this after an interview with former, former Carroll County Prosecutor Robert Ives, who was working this case before his retirement. Keep in mind, McCollum is also a crime scene analyst for an Atlanta Metro news station, as well as director of the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute, so I'd say she's a fairly credible and reliable source. I'll link her article in the description where she originally quoted Robert Ives referring to the signatures as non-secular. However, she quickly redacted that statement from the article with no explanation shortly after publishing it on her CrimeOnline.com blog. Did McCollum write something that was actually agreed to be off the record? Maybe Ives made a mistake in telling her too much. Perhaps she misunderstood something he said to her. Or maybe Ives wanted her to report this, but other law enforcement re reached out requesting a retraction. We may never know the answers to these questions, but rumors of religious signatures have been swirling around this case for years. Perhaps Burge Guy was attempting some sort of strange ritual using a doll or dolls. Or maybe he just has some strange obsession with dolls. There are even some fetishes that involve the use of various types of dolls or even dressing up like dolls or stuffed animals. However, there's a statement from law enforcement that has always left me thinking. In April of 2019, Doug Carter spoke directly to the killer, saying that, quote, I can assure you that how you left them in that woods is not, is not what they are experiencing today. This statement has always stood out to me, but it doesn't get spoken about as often as some others. It just seems odd to remind the killer that the girls are not still experiencing what he did to them. And the way Carter repeated is not was so emphasized. It would seem pretty logical and obvious that their killer absolutely knows they're deceased. But quote, 
not what they are experiencing today. What if there were some sort of religious doll or figurine made to represent eternal unity with the girls or with the event, or perhaps even something more spiritually possessive? It's often made me think of the Zodiac Killer and how he said he was collecting slaves for the afterlife. Maybe Bridge Guy was attempting some sort of ritual with his victims to keep them tied to him in some way, either in this plane of, si of existence or the next. Remember that the Shabti dolls found in Egypt were believed to help guide souls to the afterlife. And many people today believe that a poppet can be used for all kinds of spells that target people or even their souls. If the rumors of dolls are true, and if the rumors of non-secular signatures are also true, then maybe it isn't such a wild notion. Of course, it's just speculation about one possibility of many in this horrific case. Quickly before wrapping things up, let's cover what Robert Ives did actually say on the Down the Hill podcast. When Barb McDonald asked him about the odd crime scene, Ives replied that all crime scenes are probably odd, but adds that there were, quote, a variety of things at the scene of the crime, and not your normal, a person was killed here crime scene. He and the interviewers have a brief conversation about what may constitute a normal crime scene. Ives then says, quote, all I can say about the situation with Abby and Libby is that there was a lot more physical evidence than that at the crime scene. And it's probably not what you would imagine, what people think I'm talking about. It's probably not. Andrew Iden later asks him flat out if there were signatures, and Ives responds, quote, I would say there were two or three things. I'd say at least three, end quote. He later guesses that some of those things could pop up again if the person were to commit more murders. Ives also went on Dr. Oz and referred to the signatures as items. So while a signature can be a variety of behaviors that may not include leaving an item, we can probably assume that in this case, at least some of the signatures Ives is referring to are actual items left by the killer. Toe Blesenby has also commented, albeit very briefly, on the odd crime scene. When Barbara McDonald asked him about whether he agrees with Ives regarding several specific signatures, he simply replies, mm-hmm, twice in agreeance. He then goes on to talk about how the crime scene, quote, will tell you a story, and when putting all the evidence together, that story can be told. Captain Dave Burston called the murders and crime scene very complicated and very involved in the February 2017 press conference. Even Sergeant Kim Riley has made brief comments on the crime scene. In the HLN two-part special for Down the Hill, he reiterated how obvious it was that foul play was involved and that the girls' deaths were clearly not an accident. He also confirmed that there was a lot of physical evidence that was worked over at the scene for four days by four different CSIs. Doug Carter also described the crime scene as very complex and guesstimated that law enforcement only knows about two-thirds of the story of what happened there that day. All in all, every official statement seems to confirm that there were odd physical signatures at the crime scene, and that it was a very complicated one, one that will tell a complex story when put together. The question does remain, however, were these odd signatures truly of a non-secular nature? And if so, exactly what sort of religion or spirituality was represented? And that's going to be it for this video. As always, if you know or discover any information that could help investigators positively identify the man on the bridge or about the Anthony Schatz profiles, please contact the tip line. And keep yourselves and your loved ones safe out there.